the guard checker. Hi there, could you put me through to the Gennaro room, please? One second. Jason. Ah. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Hello, Liam. How you doing? No, well, and you? Very good, very good. You, I think you've uh, got to take your record company to task. I can't believe that they're making you speak to the entire world in two days. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's been all right, man. You know, it's, it's got to be done. So it's, it's important to, to tell people about the record, what it's about. You know, spread the spread the word. Absolutely, out. absolutely. Well, congratulations. Um, I got a copy of it last uh, late last week. Um, a phenomenal return. Thanks a lot. It's a different record, and it's, we're, we're all really excited about it. You know. Mm -hmm. And uh, as everyone would say, a while in coming, but sometimes the way the the wait is well worth it. <laughs> sometimes. Because <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it was a definite journey, this record. But uh, you know, I think uh, there's, there's a story behind why it took so long. Mm. Um, um, do you want me to tell you? <laughs> the, uh, you can give me the proceed version, yeah. I'll give you this, this quick version. So basically, like, um, you know, toured a lot off the last album up until 2000, very tired. Mm. We're kind of all fed up with each other. I decided to take a year and a half off, just, you know, go drinking with my friends, just having a good time. Mm. Started working on the, um, a record to, halfway through 2001. Um, wrote five tracks. One of them was Baby's Got a Temper. Yeah. Released that track half, halfway through 2002. Decided that the record was actually like a sonic description of the band at that time. It was a complete mess, and just uh, I think that I'm glad the record came out because it displayed a new way forward. So mm. after that point, I decided I'd, I'd been the tracks I've written for the new record. So we got rid of those tracks, and that took me to the end of 2002. I just uh, decided then to start completely again. I started on my studio in Essex, right. and. Uh, um, found that I just was completely blank. I just didn't have a way forward and I messed around for four months. I believe I went a bit crazy in that time, went a bit mad and mm. kind of was in a cocoon, just me and my producer and decided after four months to get the hell out of my house, locked the studio door, brought a laptop and just went mobile and just, you know, I could go to New York, I could go to London, I could just travel around mm. writing music, getting inspiration from different places and I was just inspired from things going on around me, you know? Sure. And that was when uh, 2003 March was when I started writing the record so a couple of false starts but eventually got myself into the right headspace and then got on, got it on you know Was it difficult <clears throat> in a way because I mean so much had happened and, and I'm sure at that point you know with music having evolved and you being responsible for a lot of that evolution I suppose um, you know that you sort of think well you know the expectation on you you know the longer it took the greater the expectation I think the greatest pressure was before Baby's Got Temper in that time period there because the, that was the if you think that was a lot the next thing I did after Fat the Land yeah so after that record came out and it you know it wasn't it wasn't a good record the expectation was down so like people sure. didn't expect they, people like Prodigy oh well you know they did Baby's Got Temper that wasn't very good do you know what I mean so mm -hmm. the expectation was already low so I think the biggest pressure time was before that record came out and I, a lot of the pressure always comes from myself just because that's the way I am that's the type of person I am sure sure um, so I think that with uh, when I was as soon as I was on the right track I didn't feel pressurised because I was just happy and I was kind of I found my hole if you were yeah I mean? yeah but now does it does it matter to you that this record does well because of what you've done I already feel successful because I because I like my record I think people who I don't know how I, I judge success on like being able to travel around the world and, sure. play, and play this music to people Sure. I mean, it's a different market out there now. Do you know what I mean? We can't, no, no band can rely on record sales anymore. It's a no. completely different thing than it was seven years ago. Sure. You know I mean? And I think no one's under any illusion, do you know what I mean, that any band now is going to do the same damage as it was going to do seven years ago. So, True. like I said, the success is based upon like, us being able to play our gigs and to some extent, like, record sales are... I kind of the less important thing now mm. is the marketplace do you know what I mean sure, sure I mean the last point I, I could be happy 
is, when I was in the studio, it's basically that's the last point the record is personal to me, and then mm. now the whole world will get it soon. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's very important to be happy at that last stage, you know what I mean? I, I really was, you know. Sure, and I mean, you've already achieved so much success, so I suppose you could argue that, in a way, um, you've proved the point to yourself that you could do this and you could do it extremely well, so now you do it because you, because you can, not because you have to. <laughs> I, do, I still have to because I'm, I, I'm still hungry for it. I have to write music because I don't do anything else. Do you know what I mean? I'm, yeah. I, I'm like, if I if I did it for just for fun, I'd be very lazy about it. Do you know what I mean? I sure. do do it because I I can't do anything else, and I like to prove to constantly prove to myself that I can rock the beats. Do you sure. Know what I mean? like, if I if I got lazy and, and just thought oh, I'll just do it for fun, I, I probably wouldn't bother going on tour. I probably I'd just be too laid back about it. So, but it's. I think it's fair to say I'm just all me, Keith and Maxim, we're all really hungry to get back on the road and play these tracks, do you know what I mean? Is this your best record? I think it's my best album all the way through. I think, like, Fat in the Land, if I can be, if I can, because I'm allowed to pick my music up. Sure. Like, <laughs> I think, like, Fat in the Land... <laughs> that the land had some killer tunes on it, but mm. it wasn't consistent. I think it was a tool to play live. Sure. I, mean, I think I think Jilted Generation was quite quite flawed in some of it. It was, it was too long and also um, sometimes too varied. It was kind of quite a mixed up album. And I think this album for me is like an album that you can listen to in your car. Yeah. It's quite a sexy album, but it's also quite a different album in the way it's it it just it's quite varied as well. It kind of goes from. Um, it goes from um, kind of being quite dancey to quite sort of kind of punk rock in places. Yes, I mean. yes. But I think it's, uh, I'm really happy with the record. I mean, it's up to other people to decide that, but I, I know I like it, you know. Mm. And then the, and the people that you, you know, that, that guest on the album, I mean, you've got a, a great mix of people too. And I mean, people will look to that and go, you know, wonder what the inspiration was uh, behind getting someone like Juliet Lewis involved. Um, well, the inspiration was that she had a wicked voice and mm. it was totally unexpected. Do you know what I mean? People wouldn't expect to, to hear her appearing on a Prodigy record. No. And my friend in LA, he went to one of her gigs in the Viper Rooms, rang me up and he was like, I've just been to see this band, Juliet Lewis and the Licks. Mm. And he goes, you've got to check it out. And he goes, it was actually Juliet Lewis, the actress. And I was like, oh yeah, you know, and he's like, no, check the voice out. You know, so I, I got hold of her voice, spoke to a management company and just was really excited about it when I heard the voice just thought it, this could be really off the wall you know and mm. just quite a bizarre collaboration mm. so I, I pressed her to like I got hold of her and just uh, she was really excited about making a weird track and we, we ended up doing this track Hot Ride yes. it's quite off the wall and she came over to London and we recorded it we messed around with different ideas mm. and uh, just the idea of injecting a bit more humour back into the prodigy as far as like it's like a twisted humour with yes. Hot Ride it's like we stole we stole stole the, the lyric off um, um, the fifth dimension up up and away my beautiful balloon yes and it's just when people hear the lyrics they'll it's kind of a twisted humour that was in Smack My Bitch Up and Firestar yes very it's much like, it's, like, it's like a cheekiness and a kind of like a I mean I'm deadly serious about my music do you know what I mean but sure. I know when it's when it's cool to me it's when it's kind of just comfortable with itself and it's it's kind of it's, it's kind of cheeky and it, I think Girls the single has got that as well and I think yes. we've lost that with Baby's Got a Temper do you know what I mean yeah I agree I agree we're yeah. taking ourselves far too seriously with that record mm-hmm. and then I mean the balance of the people that you that you you know that you wanted on the record was there you know was there thinking or was it a case of just saying you know you wanted Liam on their record just because it, it seemed right well basically first of all like I I wanted this record not to be collaboration heavy so exactly yeah. I chose three I chose three tracks which were full vocals all the way through one of them was Twister one of them was Mr. Gallagher and one of them was Juliet Lewis yes and all the other those tracks are really like the Liam Howlett side of the Prodigy album mm. the other tracks are more traditional Prodigy tracks a track like Spitfire yeah it's like one of my favourite tracks on the album it opens the album and it's the track of intent it just yeah. starts and it's it sounds like World War Four is about to start it does, yeah. and it just drops and it's it's going to be a good live tune that and it just uh, it's a very simple 
simple primal tune that would just kind of connect with people on a, on a raw energy level, do you know what I mean? Mm. Um, much the same as kind of Smack My Bitch Up did, that, mm. that type of kind of direct message, do you know what I mean? And did you, I mean, it's a terms like you went to a lot of different places, you know, that all, from the point of view that you try to incorporate as many sounds, like almost literally, you know, if you, you trawled through your entire record collection to, you know, to expose yourself and make sure that the record represented in some ways probably the last 30 years of music. Um, one thing I didn't do on this album was I, I didn't listen to a lot of new music. I mean, I, I always get attracted by kind of Middle Eastern melodies and stuff. Yes. So I think there's a lot of stuff like that on this album. But I, one thing I didn't do was I didn't go out to listen to lots of music. I tried to get influenced by things that were going on around me for everyday life, like I've walked... I had a studio in Stoke Newington, Hackney. I'd walk down the high street and just go into different shops and just kind of, it's a very colourful area. And, you know, people play lots of music and I'd just go home after after listening, got walking down the street and then I'd write a track based around what I remember, you know? Mm -hmm. So it was written in a completely different way, this album. I think the fact that the land was written around live, a live period when we were constantly playing live, constantly watching bands. And mm -hmm. that's what makes this album different. It's kind of like a, just drawing on different influences. Influences. There's a lot of 80s kind of it's more yeah. flashy, more sexy, you know. It's nice, yeah. A lot of 80s influences in it. Yeah. And um, are, are you going to not repeat the the mistakes of the past in the sense that you, you know, like you did on the last record that you um, toured so heavily that you, you know, literally alienated yourselves from one another, or is it going to be a slightly yeah. different approach? Well, I think we're all a bit wiser now, and we kind of like. I think that we we've learnt the way to do it. You know, we kind of. We have to make sure there's time. If we want this band to continue, we have to make sure there's time to record music. And it's just planning about, do you know what I mean? It's mm. kind of being a bit more wise and a bit more kind of street wise when mm. it comes to figuring out when we need time to sort of to write music and stuff, you know? But I mean, we we got we want to get out there and, and play live and work hard to rock it, you know, and just mm. uh, do our jobs, you know? Yeah, because in a way, yeah, I mean, you know that your market's um, very, very fickle. I mean, I think every album you bring out, um, you, you make it more difficult for you yourself because they know what you can do so in a way I mean this this is a very important record for you isn't it they're all as important as each other I think like no one can afford to be relaxed about any situation do you know what I mean we um, you know I think as well with each different album from album 2 to album 3 we lost fans but we picked up new ones mm. from this out from the previous album to this one we'll lose fans and we'll pick up new ones so mm. it's just about getting out there and playing live and ramming it down people's throats do you know what I mean <laughs> so the next two next two years your life are, are taken up I'm sure <laughs> <laughs> well Liam I know your time is at a premium um, I think I've, I've I've taken my time um, but thank you uh, very much for, for taking time to talk to us thanks a lot cheers and all the best eh? thanks bye, bye.